let's look to the Lord in prayer and ask for his guidance. But also we're going to, uh, Judith is going to have to leave a little bit early. We're going to pray for her because she needs housing. And we're going to pray that the Lord will open up doors for housing. We know that it's impossible to find, seems like right down here. And like the school can't find a house and she needs a house. And so we'll just pray that um, the Lord will reveal the home that he has already determined that she will have, and we all believe that absolutely is truth. But when you go... Th- hmm? For Judith, for housing. Yeah, the school still needs housing. <laughs> That's old news. <laughs> to purchase a rent. To rent. So, um, yes. Oh, and this may be one you didn't. I think you might have had it last week. Okay, one of the things that I think is important, and Judith and I were talking about this. That's okay. okay. Thank you. Um, when she was saying she knows that God has a plan, it will be fine. We all know that. Instinctively, deep down in our hearts, we know that. But there is that humanness in us, and I don't think it's foolish on our part to say, but I need to know what step to take. Because we don't sit and twiddle our thumbs and have God just dump something in our laps and say, you know, now, can he connect you with somebody and it comes out of clear blue? We've all had those experiences too. But we need to think, okay, this isn't working out, so what's the next step that I ought to take? Trusting God to open and shut doors. But we do have to make those first moves, and I think it behooves us all to, to support one another and say, that's not a lack of trust. That's do it, doing the pertinent thing. I go investigate. I see what's out there. And, so, and through that, God can reveal to us his plan for us. So he does that graciously and willingly, and he always does it in his perfect timing. So, Lord, we thank you that we believe all that deep down in our hearts. And I thank you that Judith is claiming that those truths for herself and trusting you for that home. So we just pray that it will open up to her and you reveal to her her next steps and that will be something that will be exciting for her and that we can all rejoice with her when she has that news to share. And Father, I thank you for each woman that is here and for the life she represents of service to you. May we listen as your Holy Spirit teaches us through your word to see what you would have us to learn that we might be faithful witnesses to our Lord Jesus Christ in whose name we are called sealed and sanctified forever in jesus name amen i gave my kids a list of words sanctified justified salvation and i said give me a definition then find scripture verses with it (laughs) they kind of struggle with some of them which is fine now i have a lesson i can teach (laughs) but i love giving them throwing out some of those big words that are difficult and i think we did a study some on those words that we use so that we understood what they really mean But in Christ, you know that we have everything that we need, and he is the one who will uh, guide us in every step that we are going, as he did the early disciples. And once again, when I prepared to teach and refresh my memory over what my notes are and so forth, I just see Jesus with those disciples, Matthew being one of them, and one of the ones that seems kind of an odd choice if we were choosing 12. Well, none of them seemed like a really good choice, except maybe John, if we were choosing them, right? Again, deliberately teaching them what they needed so desperately to know before he died, rose again, and then ascended into heaven. The time was short. The amount of spiritual truths that he needed to impart to them was vast. <clears throat> and it is for us today. But because we have the completed word and we have the old fulfilled in the new and we're, Jesus was talking about them to help them understand how those are joined together. As Jewish men, they were pretty much indoctrinated into Old Testament truths. How much they believed it, how deep it was ingrained in their hearts and souls and their minds, we don't really know at the beginning of their walk, we have more understanding when they started writing the books and when we <clears throat> see what they accomplished for the Lord. But he could take them back. Okay, you've heard this. 
this is the Old Testament, but I'm going to fulfill it. I'm not destroying it. It's still valid. So those things you learn are valid, and we want to build on them. Very much like we can do with, with children or people that are young adults or even in their older years, and, and they say, well, you know, I think when I was a child, I went to some revival, and, and I, I said some prayer. I asked Jesus into my Build on it. Okay, that was your old understanding. You can have a new fulfilled understanding. But there's some spiritual truths that we can take foundationally. So Jesus wasn't going to throw them out and say, oh, well, I'm going to fulfill all that. Ignore it. God wouldn't have given it to us if it weren't pertinent to what was going to be happening when Jesus is teaching the disciples as we were reading in Matthew. And it's pertinent for all times as he is fulfilling all of that. I love that huge. It's, it's a mammoth picture of God's plan, isn't it? I mean, how vast is it? We, we can't comprehend his vastness, his sovereignty, his love. I mean, there's nothing about God that our finite minds can comprehend. But I think it is good for us to be challenged as we delve into it to see what was this huge truth that he wanted us to grasp hold of. He would not have taught us those things if he knew we would never understand him. He would have said, yeah, a couple of you can, you know. Like in my class today, one of my boys said, can I please do something? I'm done and I'm bored. Okay. If I just talk to him and so the rest of them, you can't get it. So, you know, you work in it. But we're taught spiritual things without any differentiation because the Holy Spirit indwells us. He hadn't yet come, of course, because Jesus was still alive. But he knew that he would, and so those things that were still in darkness would be made light. And the whole expanse of God's love and purpose would suddenly, even still mysteriously, make sense. Oh, I get it. Do I understand it? Not in this lifetime. <laughs> Is it necessary to understand it? No. We accept it by faith, and as we do, God reveals more and more of it to us and draws back the veil so that we can see, oh, I understand. It really makes sense now that I see why you asked Abraham to take Isaac and allowed him to actually bind him and to pick up a knife. I understand that now. Is that hard? It's hard. Is that love? <laughs> Is that grace and mercy? All in one act of obedience from a man he just called from idol worship to follow him. And we build on that and we build on it. To those truths are so rich that our faith is full of phenomenal truths that should make us have aha moments every day in our walk with Jesus. And I think we have to challenge ourselves sometimes. Have I had an aha moment recently? Or if it's just kind of, oh, the norm, yeah, he does that, he does, oh, yeah, I know, I'm going to have to wait. And no, those truths are rich and they're deep if we allow them to penetrate our hearts and our souls and our minds. And Jesus did not teach them to us with the idea that I guess some of you get it and some of you won't. To those he has called and made his own, we can get it. <laughs> okay. The outside world cannot until they have an encounter with him. And then their minds too and their spirits too will be opened up to understand and embrace the truths that he is teaching. That helps us understand two things. Why it can be so precious to us and so confounding to the world. All right, we are in kingdom parables in Matthew chapter 13, and we're ready for the 11. We talked about the wheat and the tares and why God permits that. And I think all of us at times, <laughs> sometimes jokingly or sometimes just because we know we understand each other, said, you know, it's getting a little tough dealing with these tares all the time. 
living in this world, we're affected by the world, and it gets pretty ugly, and we kind of just said, could you just get me out of this world? And at the same time, we're asked to not be of it, but to live peacefully within it. And we want to slap them silly and tell them how stupid we think they are. Shake them. How can you act like that? And that's when we have to say, because they're in the world. They look like the Father. The other side of that is we look like our Father and our Savior. And that's what they don't like. There's two sides to this. And that's always going to be. So we're left here because if you take us out, there's no witness. In the latter days, when the Spirit is moved, when we're gone, when we're snatched away, if we have a rapture, if we just wait for the second coming, and I just say that if because covenant teaches a little different, has a little different views on it than my Southern Baptist upbringing. And we know we're going to heaven. Okay. But when we're taken out, if we're taken out early, when we're, or when you're taken out and you're the only influence in the family, when the light is gone, the darkness is overwhelming, isn't it? So we're here among the weeds so that we can be light. And it gets tough because the weeds want to choke out the good soil and the good seed and the good little flower that's trying to bloom. And the world around you is trying to make you feel very, very uncomfortable. Good. We don't want to get comfortable in their world, do we? But they wouldn't bother to try to overpower us and choke us out if we weren't threatening. They say, oh, that's fine what you believe. I am just good. Oh, we can talk about it all day long. It doesn't bother me. Well, that should bother us because that means they're not under any kind of conviction. But it does bother them. And Jesus said, that's going to be that way until I come. And he was preparing them so that these disciples that he was teaching in real time when we're reading what Matthew has recorded, okay, they would not be shocked, overwhelmed, ready to to drop and run everything because I didn't know it would be like this. Those people don't want to hear this. You said they wanted to hear this. This is good news. No, I'm telling you, they won't like you. They will really hate you, and it will be very difficult. And I'm leaving it that way because if I don't put you in the middle of the world, where's the witness? We sometimes go into those dark places, don't we, Marie, and we feel it. Because everything that's happening around us, sometimes we need to be there. It's not comfortable. And we feel the darkness. But we are still the light. And we have to be. Jesus was gracious in explaining that so that before they faced it, they could begin to comprehend a little bit about it. And it's so helpful. I mean, I find myself in, when I'm in those situations that, okay, you said it'd be like this. They don't necessarily like me. <laughs> they may not like me at all. And guess what we all think about ourselves, you know, from I even had one friend one time, she was so upset because somebody didn't like her. And it was it wasn't a Christian thing, although she was one and she said, Well, why wouldn't everybody like me? Why wouldn't people like me? and she was so honest, it just ended up being kind of funny. <laughs> but she was very honest. And everybody didn't like her. She was one of those people everybody liked. Except one teacher, she she doesn't like me. <laughs> But when we have, why, why don't they like me? <laughs> Anybody ever feel that way? <laughs> ah, oh, it's our human nature, isn't it? Well, guess who's not surprised about how we feel? Jesus, because that's how he made us. So in teaching us how to live and how to face those unexpected situations we're in, he's letting us know that, yes, that's how you feel, but it's going to get difficult, and here's why it's going to get difficult. That really does make it a little bit easier. It isn't going to be pleasant, and he never said it would be. But it does help me once I say, oh, yeah, all right. <laughs> of course they don't like me. <laughs> no. Okay. I had to stop two parents today this morning and had their son with me, and I said, we have to talk. And I saw the look on that kid's face, and I don't think he likes me very well right now. <laughs> okay. Okay, sometimes people, we... Why? 
Because we point out their sin. We, by living for Christ, point out their sin if we never say a word to them if we're a faithful witness. Our life, the way we respond to tragedies, the way we respond to things that are happening in the world, disappointment, illnesses, broken families, our day-to-day life, when they see something different in the way we handle those, they know we're different. They may not want to know why, at least at this point, but it differentiates us. The world. So Jesus is telling them in the parables the things that they can visualize and say, oh, that's how it's going to be in the spiritual world versus the darkness in the world, which is there. So, so, and then he talks about the mustard seed and how teeny tiny it is, but how it can blossom. Faith can be tiny, but when we plant it in Jesus and believe it, our faith blossoms and he'll give us more faith. Don't quit asking for faith. He wants to give us more faith. And I want to give you more heat. <laughs> turn up the heat. <laughs> Hopefully the, the message turns up the heat. Okay. It's so important for us to appreciate, I think, Jesus was being, in a very gentle way, being the master teacher and giving them lessons they could learn from and understand as they grew spiritually and when they were in certain circumstances they could recall that oh that's right he said that so it's okay because we knew this was coming in one form or another and then uh the 11 verses 13 uh, chapter 13 verses 33 to 35 we know that there are a lot of uses of the word leaven in the old testament and the unleavened bread, as we still have for communion. Okay, <clears throat> so the, the yeast makes things rise. Unleavened, it doesn't, it doesn't rise. And what does the leaven do? And what does it, does it cause to happen? That's something they would do because they made bread, right? It's a real-life visual. Oh, I know what it does and what it doesn't do. Okay? You ever tried to bake something and you had yeast in it and it just stayed flat? Something was wrong with the yeast, wasn't it? Okay, and you knew that even though you didn't, you thought you did everything right. So again, a lesson from which they can learn a spiritual truth. So he talks about the mustard seed, and then he goes right into a thirty-three. He told them another parable, and notice he said, "The kingdom of heaven." What kind of reality at this point in the life of the disciples? was the kingdom of heaven in their mind. Mm -hmm. What they were taught as a Jew. Is that what Jesus was talking about? He's introducing a new kind of a kingdom, right? Isn't he? And so he can use the word that they know. Oh, kingdom. Oh, and we had some kings. What is this? Key words. And think about this when you're sharing the gospel, too. Sometimes a key word can pique their interest. I want to go back to what you said about that. Now, only the Holy Spirit can usually give you those key words. And, and once you have shared the gospel, particularly if you shared it with some people who have never heard it before, you've kind of learned what some of those trigger words are that might make them ask some questions. And that's always good because once they ask questions, you know they're a little bit interested, and then you can give another answer or ask another question. Well, why do you think this? Or what do you think? And then you can add to it. And Jesus was the master at that. So he tells them another parable. And he's already explained why he's teaching in parables. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven. That a woman took and laid in three measures of flour. Till it was all leavened. Do they get that picture? When she put the leaven in the flour, what happened to it? Oh. Okay, so what's that got to do with the kingdom of heaven? Well, they hadn't a clue at the moment. And if we just have that bit of teaching and go back to the Old Testament and try to draw some, you know, connections, we might not quite understand it yet. But in the broader sense, as they were developing in their faith, their walk with Jesus, learning more and more about what was going to happen to him, knowing that he was going to leave them, but send him a comforter, they could understand, okay, this understanding, this little bit of leaven that we have planted, it's going to grow, it's going to 
expand when the Holy Spirit gets in it. It's going to not just sit there and do nothing. If it's genuine, it's going to grow and grow. And harvest will come from that. If you've ever tried to bake bread and it didn't rise, it's terrible when you eat it. But then there's not near as much as there is when the loaves rise really beautifully, right? And you think, wow, this works. Because the leaven's good and it's planted in the spot that will grow it. They can kind of relate to that. It's a little more foreign to us because most of us don't make bread. <laughs> I don't guess. <laughs> but uh, we buy it already made, which is so nice. <laughs> Easy. Okay. Well, let's see. I think I better tell you another parable. Jesus is probably thinking to himself as he's seen the looks on their faces. I don't think I get this. I don't get this. Now, you know that I always ad, ad lib <laughs> make up the things that I think might have happened. I don't think it's you know, outside the realm of possibility. These are Jewish men who have attended synagogue. They have watched the religiousness of the Sadducees and the Pharisees and recognize that they were fake, you know. They have paid their dues. They have done their thing. They have tried, as Matthew did, to keep the foot in the world and in synagogue and be Jewish and Roman at the same time. Some of them were more devout, of course. They knew at least part of the Old Testament law and all those prophecies. Okay, So Jesus is spouting all these things to them, and they have to be stymied. There couldn't have been in that group any of them that were looking. Got it. I understand it. Marilyn, you got that? Mm-hmm. I got that. Terry, did you get that? Yeah. We all got it right. What in the world is he saying? Huh? What's he talking about? Yeah. That would be a response. And I, but I love that. He told them anyway. Tell them anyway. They're going to ask questions later. They're going to experience, and then they're going to understand it. The gospel is a mystery, isn't it? Until you've experienced it, it's very difficult to help somebody understand it. But Jesus did not not tell them because it would go over their heads or because they were staring at him. He just kept telling them, and <laughs> he said, okay, I'm going to tell you another one. I know you haven't got that. We'll come back to that later, maybe. But, but I think that's a, a great image for us to, for, for two reasons. You can see Jesus as a, as a human teacher desperately loving this, these men, knowing he's going to Calvary for these men and all that he will draw to himself, wanting so much to instill in them every bit of truth that he could before he was no longer in person with them because of the ministry he was leaving them in charge of. And so he would see their baffled looks, but he would continue to tell them a little bit more and a little bit more, knowing that at that point when the Holy Spirit came, and that's maybe three years yet to come, approximately, they would have those aha moments. Now it makes sense. But I've got it. I've got it. I can go back. Those kids who heard the Sunday school stories when they're children and ran away from it. Sometimes something in their adult life may think, oh, I can go back to those. I have something to draw on. And Jesus gave them material truths to draw on as they were getting into the line of fire, if you will, serving him until their death. But for us, because we can connect all the dots in the old and the new, we can see the richness of it that they could not see at the moment it was told to them. But nonetheless, it was pertinent. No less so for them than for us, because the same teacher, Jesus, is giving the information, and the same teacher, Holy Spirit, is teaching us and instilling in us, that, yes, this is truth. This is truth. And it's truth simply because Jesus said it. We don't have to expound on why it's truth. Jesus said it. 
And that's the core of understanding the word, too. It is truth, because he is truth. And we've had those discussions many times in class about how many truths people think there are. But Jesus is helping them to know, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And nobody will come to the Father but through me. Boys, <laughs> I'm getting you ready because you're going to go tell the world. Sisters, he's getting us ready through his word because we've got to tell the world. Just as they had to tell the world. But the parables are so that they can understand in simpler ways. And so Jesus goes ahead and explains it in the next verse, 34. <clears throat> All those things he said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. And then we're going to talk about how he's talking about fulfilling the prophecies. Now, Matthew, when he's writing this after the fact, takes a different turn and says, now Jesus is addressing crowds. Before, he seemed to be addressing the disciples in particular, but we know there were crowds around him. Okay. Now, Matthew is making a distinction. Through the revelation of the Holy Spirit, Matthew now realizes what he and the twelve heard that seemed to be very much to them. He was speaking to the crowds and explaining why he had to teach in those simple stories. The vocabulary that I told you I gave my students are not vocabulary that you start teaching children in kindergarten when you want to teach them about Jesus. Okay, we're going to learn about justification, sanctification, redemption, you know, repentance. Will we lose them? Mm -hmm. We start with the little words and we build on it. Okay, so Jesus is using the little stories to build on it. The gospel is simple enough that we can start with the little things and build up, but we can't start with the big things and water it down because we'll lose people. Okay, and so that's what Jesus is doing. And so <clears throat> he said, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. <laughs> that's an exciting verse. What Jesus is now explaining and teaching in parables is that which was hidden, clouded in the Old Testament until the word became flesh and dwelt among us and then fulfilled all things. So when Isaiah is saying a virgin will bring forth a son and they were a little bit confused about when would that be and where would it be and they weren't connecting the dots in all the prophecies because Jesus said, you know, you still can't quite get to spiritual truths until everything can be revealed. Could some in the Old Testament and did some, such as the prophets who were delivered those messages and those who heard them and believed with an open mind, understand? Yes, but it was still hidden until the fullness of Christ and all things are revealed and the mystery is made known even while we can't totally understand the mystery. And that's a mystery, isn't it? It's one of those difficult aspects of truth that while it can be simple, it can be convoluted at the same time. So sometimes you have to dissect it into pieces so that you can build upon it. And that's how those little stories do. Okay? We could fascinate a child by saying, what would you think if you got in the belly of a whale? Would you get seasick? Would you be lonely for mommy and daddy? Would you be one? And they could have a whole lot of fun talking about that. But unless at some point you can build on why that's a spiritual truth, it's a nice presented like that make-believe story. Okay. There's a deeper truth, isn't it? On the surface, we don't see it until we delve deeply wanting to know the spiritual truths. And when we need to know, God will reveal them to us. And there are passages that are very difficult to teach. And I usually share with you sometimes, well, I struggle and I read every commentary that I trust and think, I'm still not sure I get it. Holy Spirit, I need a new revelation, not a new one, not something that he didn't ever give, but one to help me understand that. Guess what? He'll do it. Because it is a mystery. But he's explaining why he was doing that so that they begin to put some of the pieces together. 
But also he warns them throughout his teaching, if it, your eyes are blind because you don't want to know the truth. If somebody doesn't want to admit they're wrong, it doesn't matter how much evidence you have in front of them. If they won't look at the evidence, can you get them to admit that they're wrong? No, you can't. Okay? All right? So that's what Jesus is kind of, I can give you all the evidence, but if you're spiritually, thank you. If your spiritual eyes are blinded by the enemy, the evil one, Satan, they will be blinded until you desire to have the blinders removed. And you dare to want to hear some of that truth. And people have to be brave sometimes to want to hear that truth because it's going to put, put all the onus on them to do something about what they're going to discover. Oh, I'm sinful. We understand it because we're believers and we went through that process at some time. Whatever age we were, we recognized, oh, yeah, I'm a sinner. <laughs> okay. So Jesus is trying to help them understand why he chooses to do this. And then he's got another example. He explained to us the parable of the weeds. Good step in understanding. Okay, exp explain that to me. If we don't know how to do something and, and somebody's trying to teach you, I mean, I don't, I don't get it. Would you please explain it? There's not a good teacher alive that wouldn't say, I've been dying for you to ask me. Yeah, I'll explain it. I want to explain it because I want you to want to know. And once you ask me to explain it, you're going to have ears to receive it. But until that point, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to know that. You know? We all do that at times. Because <laughs> sometimes those facts are so annoying, aren't they? You know? But now he's got an audience who's more open to receive his message. So he said, the one who sows the seed, the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world, and the good seed is the children of the kingdom. Okay, The weeds are the sons of the evil one. Okay, is that starting to make sense? We heard somebody went out with this big bag of grain, he threw it and threw it, and some soil was good. Okay, that's literal. That can literally happen if you're sowing seed that way, which is the way they did in those days. You can still sow it on rocky ground today and have a few your kernels of corn come up or some wheat come up. And so even though the soil isn't the best, farmers know that. And they were farmers. They saw it happen. Okay, I understand that. But what does it really mean in the spiritual sense? So then he gets to, the, okay, that good seed. And good is a key word. We have a lot of synonyms for good that are even more powerful. That perfect seed was sown. What's the seed that we sow? As believers. The word. the word. And the hearts are ready to receive it. They grab hold of it, just like the good soil. But he going to say, now here's the spiritual side of this, and this is why it matters. He wasn't trying to help the farmers do better, <laughs> you know. It wants the Christians to do better. He said, okay, and the good seed is the children of heaven or the kingdom. Again, he goes back to that idea of kingdom that they've had growing up in, in the Old Testament. And we don't quite use it as much. I love thinking about it. We're children of the kingdom, aren't we? We're daughters of a king. How precious is that? That's an absolute we are. We're part of an eternal kingdom invited in by the king himself to be his heirs, to be at his banquet table. So now they say, you'll be children of the kingdom. Why was that really important? Not only for the disciples, but for those crowds. They had been taught in synagogue that you're not as righteous as I am because I'm a Pharisee or I'm a Sadducee. I'm a scribe. You aren't that good. All corrupt doctrine, right? But it almost said, Jesus said, if you receive this and believe what I'm teaching you, that soil, you'll become one of the children. Can you imagine how excited some of those people must have felt? We know there were people in that crowd who were there simply because Jesus might do a miracle, and that would be exciting. 
But there had to be people there, just like there is in every crusade anybody holds, every Sunday morning in a church, even Bible studies, sometimes even small groups in the world that are hungry for truth. Just give me something I can hang on to. And maybe if they hear it and they want to receive it, and then they're being told, if you receive it, you're part of the kingdom. <laughs> oh, wow. I've been wanting to be part of something that matters all my life. And you're telling me I can't because it fell on good soil. And the good soil is the soil that's been prepared sometimes by us as we share our testimonies. Okay. Sometimes by the Holy Spirit who is just making them very much aware that there are people around them who are living differently and are happier and more satisfied with life. And they're being curious. And so they are excited about what they can hear. And that's the good soil, and that's where we want it to fall. It won't all fall on that. There's a lot more bad soil out there. Okay. The weeds are the sons of the evil one and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. Okay, now we have the two kingdoms side by side, juxtaposed. What's going on? The kingdom of God is sowing the seed in the hearts of those he's preparing to come into the kingdom. And when they do, they're part of the kingdom. Satan and his sons, he has his demons. Don't ever forget it. Now, I know we talk about this frequently, but it is a baffling thought sometimes. Really up there, and the, they're battling. Okay? And Satan has his demon. He's the head honcho. They're his underlings who are doing exactly what he says. Go interrupt that soil. Put a weed there because I don't want that to grow. If you're very close to accepting the Lord Jesus, Satan will do everything to stop you until the moment it's too late. Forgive me if I shared my granddaddy's story, but it's so pertinent. My grandmother prayed for him for 35 years. One night he'd begrudgingly, he'd probably been <laughs> had a nip or two. Hey, great, I'll get her off my back. I'll go to this revival, and I'll hear this crazy woman preacher. And when she gave an invitation, my grandfather told he held on to the back of the pew until his knuckles were white. I will not. I will not. And Satan was winning. <laughs> and all of a sudden, and he ran down, and he said, he's real. Satan's real. I'm done. I want Jesus. That's my dad, my granddaddy's testimony. And I've heard and he, I call I like my granddad. <laughs> but his knuckles are white. Why? The sons of the devil did not want him to make that one move. That would mean now he's getting into the kingdom and he's forever lost to me. That's how bad the evil one doesn't want how much, how tenacious he is to keep people out of heaven. On the other side, Jesus is giving examples of how much he loves us when he goes to the cross and he's drawn us literally on the cross to come and have re remission of our sins in him. And the Holy Spirit is drawn us and when we respond it, then we're solidly in the kingdom. But Satan's doing the same thing on the opposite side. Okay. What happens when Satan wins? Think of all the people that could be influenced when Satan wins. Think of all the people. I'm here. Because Satan didn't win with my granddad. You're here because Satan didn't win with somebody and they said yes to Jesus. And now this may be, I may be overly dramatic, which I've been known to do sometimes. But, but this is a vivid real picture of what's going on in the spiritual world. And because his was so real, I mean, he when he he was shake, he would shake when he would. It was so real. I think he was almost afraid he couldn't get loose, you know. Okay, but the Holy Spirit's much more powerful. We head towards Jesus. Jesus will get us to Him, because He's not willing that any should perish. But they needed to understand, and the crowds were thinking. Wow, you mean there's something besides the Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes? I might want to try that. That sounds a whole lot better than what I've been hearing. It says, so Satan is busy, busy, busy. 
He never rests. God never rests either. They're both at work. Work isn't done until kingdom comes and then we'll have a different kind of work and it won't be messing with Satan. Okay. So the enemy comes. The harvest <clears throat> is the close of the age and the reapers are angels. Now we know verses about angels and I think we've had a... Uh, did we study angels one time? Probably. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Angels, Peter tells us, look down on us and almost long for the relationship that we have. With God. See, they're his messengers. They are not his redeemed. We want to be his redeemed. That's a much bigger prize. Okay. But they do his bidding. And the angels are watching. They've been watching throughout eternity as God is bidding them, go tell this, go tell this, go rescue this person, go get that person out of the ditch, get close to that person when they're losing their loved one, encompass them with your love at the bedside when they need it. All the reasons that angels are sent to us are to give us comfort, and they're sent at the moment the Father sends them to do the duty that they have been given, not of their own choice. But they look longingly down think, kind of wish I could experience what their experience but then look at what God gives them to do. Those angels, they get to sit in judgment. Because, I think, well, God didn't say exactly why. <laughs> okay. But who was Satan? Mm, one of those angels. So, when God said, all of you that want to go with him, go and forever you're cast out of my sight. And those other angels stayed. Now those faithful angels you get to judge him. And in Revelation, guess who else gets to judge? Know you not that you will judge. We get to judge too. Not because we deserved it, but because we're privileged to do so. Because we're in him. This is a huge picture of what happens at the end of the world. We all talk about how the end of the world is almost here. And it's much closer than it was. And all the signs point to it. But as we think about that and the rejoicing that we'll have when we get to heaven and how excited we are to go home and sometimes, please come, Lord, because we don't want any more of this. When the judgment is final, then the great dragnet is taken out. And those people who are coming into the kingdom are coming, and those who are in the net will be lost forever. That should drive us to our knees praying for people to witness to. Not just being really, really happy that we're on the right side. But because we are, we've been called, and we are va validated by Christ, then we have to recognize that this is what's going to happen. So he goes on to talk about what will happen at that final. He said, the harvest is close, and it is close. And we hear in Jeremiah, the, la the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. That harvest is always that picture that Jesus used in the Old Testament used to help us see all these plants growing up that are going to be harvested into the kingdom. And they represent souls that are being brought into the kingdom. And when the harvest time comes, the final harvest time, it's over. And we'll all be in heaven if we're believers. If we're the weeds, we'll be in hell. But we're here until that final time. He said, so the harvest, just at the close of the age, and the reapers are the angels, just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be in the close of the age. Well, we hear, the, hear that fire business more than once. We hear it several times throughout Jesus' teaching. We know that Lazarus wanted, or the rich man wanted Lazarus just to be able to touch his tongue with some water because he was in anguish with the fire. We hear about fire and damnation in Revelation. It is a fire that burns forever, and that's where the weeds are going to be thrown. If you're in this group of people listening to Jesus at this message, you're going to respond in one of two ways. I want what he's giving. I want this. Or they're going to dig in their heels and say, I just think this is foolishness. And I don't believe it. I am pretty good, Jew. And the religious leaders really thought they were pretty good. Right, and they hated what Jesus said. But this is a picture of the final judgment to get our attention. And it needs to get our attention, doesn't it? He said, the Son of Man 
will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all law breakers and throw them into the fiery furnace in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now when people don't want to talk about hell, read about hell. They forget that Jesus talked very specifically about them. So that in those end days when Jesus comes and gathers us, he's gathering all the others. And he mentions some of the ones, some of the qualities of those people. And we have that mentioned more than once. These people will not be in the kingdom. And that doesn't mean that people who have done any one of those heinous deeds cannot be born again if they repent of it. But he means those ones who are still living in it, digging in their heels. I want to be this way. I want to be one of Satan's followers. I don't want to repent of this sin. Or I'm going to risk it at the last minute. Maybe I can change my ways. And of course, they can't change their ways. Okay. But he talks about all the kinds of sin that will be there. But that means that it's ongoing. It's not repented of. And in our world, in one of the sheets, or the sheet I guess you have in front of me, it talks about there's a lot more weeds than there are good seeds sown, aren't there? It's just the way it's going to work out because people have a thousand reasons to reject Jesus. And they're all based on thinking, I'm somehow good enough, somehow I can make it. And they can really never tell you why they can't, you know, because they'll come up with all the reasons. Okay, and then he says, oh, look at this, ladies. There the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. We're going home, and we'll shine. Why that terminology? What did Jesus call us to be? Light. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine until Jesus comes. We are the light. And then we really will be the light. And we'll be in the presence of the light in the Father's kingdom. If you're the crowd, forget the disciples at the moment. If you're the crowd, might this be a little enticing? I'm going to follow him some more. I want to hear more. And we know, and we'll know it as we read more of Matthew. The crowds continued to follow him. They followed him until he couldn't even breathe almost. They wanted to hear more. This was life changing. This was hopefulness instead of despair. All they got in synagogue was despair. Doctrine mistaught. Guilt laid on them. Not the kind of guilt that will lead to repentance because they never offered that. Just feel sufficiently guilty and do what we tell you to do. Make sure you pay all your tithes. Make sure you do. And somehow it'll take care of it. But what was happening, what the crowds knew, what people know today, that those things we are doing may assuage our guilt for a little moment, but we go to bed every night guilty and wake up guilty in our sin, if people are honest. How do we know that? Because God said that's how we're made. We can deny it all we want. It doesn't change the fact. So the crowds who were legitimately wanting to know who Jesus was were going to continue to follow. And we're not given numbers of people that repented and chose to follow Jesus. But you know there had to be thousands in all of these crowds that said, I want to be your follower. Now, let's go back to what Peter, James, and John and Matthew were thinking about all of this. Again, we're going to be nudging each other. I don't know what this crowd's thinking, but he called us. And what does this mean we're going to have to do? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. We see the crowds, but we're called, right? We're disciples. What is he telling us to do? Go into those crowds. And later he's going to say, you feed them. Don't just give them bread. You feed them. What do we have to feed them? Spiritual food, the word of life, light, hope. You see the bigger picture? Did they understand it? Did the disciples go to bed that night and said, well, this is great. We're going to get to go <laughs> do all this. And then we're going to write about it. And people are going to be talking about it in Covenant Church some Thursday. 
way down the road and, and thinking, we were pretty neat guys. No, they went home like sometimes we do when we're getting ready to go on mission and we're thinking, oh, how are we going to do this? What are we going to say? Will they listen? And then we have to say, oh, wait a minute. What's the mandate? Go. Go. It's rather simple, isn't it, in some ways. We choose to complicate the gospel. And I believe the reason that we do is because that gives us an out at some point. Well, I couldn't tell anybody that. I couldn't. I couldn't. Yes, you can. Because if you've experienced a Jesus in your life, personally, that's what you tell. And then you can be able to answer the questions that they have. Whether they're illiterate or the brightest people in the world, they can't doubt your testimony. They can think you're crazy, and they can say, I don't doubt that he can do that. But they'll listen to your story. So your story is very important. Think about the story that the disciples were growing into as Jesus was teaching them. And as we finish, Matthew will recognize how difficult it was for them when Jesus died, and then when he rose again, how excited, but then when he left them, how sad they were. It's still a topsy-turvy world, isn't it? But because Jesus was teaching them, them and they were faithful to follow him when they knew very little about him, they stayed the course until they saw what he was teaching them in its fulfillment with him going into heaven and then being told, don't worry, he's coming back. Now they have the whole story to tell. We have the whole story to tell. We have a huge advantage over Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and Paul, and all of them. Because we see how faithful God has been throughout the ages to fulfill everything in this book that we study. And we can move forward to share it because of that truth. So it's really rich. And then he says, just in case I haven't got your attention, in case I need one more lesson, did it, and you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to be honest. Did it, but did it, any of you raise a hard-headed, stubborn child? <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. Okay. Yeah. I, I happen to know Terry's kids. I had both Terry's kids in school. Night and day. Different, weren't they? Precious. But just <laughs> unique that I, okay, I, some stubborn, okay. Now, we don't all have them. We just have, but, you know, if you're stubborn, or if you're hard-headed, or if I don't quite have your attention, and I'm a patient of parent or teachers, okay, maybe this will work. Maybe I can get you to see it, you know, if I do this. So he doesn't give up on them. He doesn't get tired of telling them stories. <sighs> Another story? <laughs> have you ever had kids? Read one more, Mommy, before you go to bed. <laughs> I'm tired of it. Or tell that one again. I don't want to hear it again. <laughs> you know? Jesus didn't do that. Do you think Jesus got weary? We know he did because he was in the flesh and he had to go away from the crowd sometimes. He needed to be alone with the Father. He needed to regroup. But as he had their attention and as he was seeing maybe blank looks on their faces, like we need to, be, if, if we're not getting through to them, sharing the gospel, you know, let the Holy Spirit direct you. Okay, let me, let me try this, and you don't have to say, okay, you're not getting that. Let me try this. And Jesus didn't berate him. Oh, goodness, you're slow. Okay, maybe this will work. No. He just, the master teacher, that, I got an idea. See if, in his mind, he says, I'll see what they do with this one. Again, another story. Again, again, and again, and again. Until we get them the message that they need to hear. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. Oh, no, I want to back up. The hidden treasure. I went too far down. The kingdom of heaven is like a hidden treasure in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. 
Okay, this is just a simple analogy. I found something that's such a treasure, and I don't want to lose it, so I'm going to make sure it's very safe, and then I'm going to buy a field so I can safely hang on to it. Or let's say you get a prized possession of your grandmother's. You want to hold on to it forever so you can give it to the kids. You put it in a real safe place at home, and then you go to the bank, and you get it, and you put it in a vault because it is such a treasure. I don't want to lose it. I don't want to lose it. Jesus said that's what the gospel is. It's such a treasure that we shouldn't want to lose it, that we'll sell everything to gain it. But then we have to share it. We can't keep it to ourselves. And then he, and then he goes on to the next one. He said about the pearl of great price. He goes and he finds the pearl of great price. Whatever that is, and everybody is trying to determine what it is. And I have a ring of my great-grandmother's, and, and it's an odd stone. It's not a very pretty stone. And my... I, Grandma said, what is it? Said, that's a pearl of great price. That's just what they happen to know. Name it. And I thought, wouldn't have paid much for it. <laughs> a pearl. Okay, what is a pearl, a treasure, what, a great price? Something that's so priceless that you will make sure you don't lose it. If I gain the world but lose the Savior. The idea, how valuable is this? How valuable is what Jesus is offering compared to the religiosity of the scribes and Pharisees? He's telling them this is worth everything. He was telling that to the crowd, but I believe more importantly, he was sharing that for us, for the disciples, for the believers. What's he worth to you? Everything. Would you... Sell him? Would you betray him for anything like Judas did? Is he the greatest treasure you could ever own? And then recognize you own it. It's a unique relationship. He possesses us, but allow us to possess him. We're his and he is ours. It's a unique relationship, isn't it? Totally built on his calling of us to be his. It's a treasure we don't want to lose, but it's a treasure that makes us so excited that we can not help but share it. And again, he wants the disciples to begin to understand that. They're going to have to share it, and they're going to have to share it knowing their lives are on the line almost immediately. Our lines haven't been on the line Yet, because we live in a world that's different than theirs was, okay? But it may be, and it is for other people sometimes, they know if they believe in Christ, they're going to be alienated from their families, disowned, they may be killed. Muslim families, Indian families, Hindu families, it's quite common. You don't, you don't belong to us anymore, okay? Because the, the cost is great, and Jesus tells them that, but not compared with what we have, <laughs> You know, not compared with the treasure that he is. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown out into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. And when it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted into good containers, but threw the bad away. Now, what was the job of some of these disciples? <laughs> Fishermen. Oh, they get that one. <laughs> you drop in the net and you get out and you think, well, that's not worth keeping. That's not worth keeping. And if you've ever been on a shipping boat, when they do that and you've watched them, you know, they know, don't they? Those fishermen know which one's good and which one's bad. Okay, now we're not going to be sorting them out like they are. I mean, Jesus, in the long run, God's going to make the judgment. But he's saying it's like that. That dragnet brings all of us. The weeds and the good soil all are going to be together. And who knows which ones are his? The Father. He can sort us out. Okay. And get rid of them. And said, so it will be at the end of the day. The angels, again, those angels get to do this great message. Will go out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into, what is it? Oh, a fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Modern day <clears throat> liberal preachers have written books and they try to get hell out of the picture. Okay. 
because it's so unpleasant. And because a loving God would never send anybody to hell. So they skirt around the issue and they make it <clears throat> palatable. Okay. So if we are born again and going to be in the kingdom of heaven literally forever, that's really pretty good, isn't it? But for those people that reject Christ and do their own thing and don't listen to the gospel and hate the gospel, actually, and listen to Satan, they get what? <laughs> A slap on the hand, an eternal sleep. If heaven is a gracious provision, and I've told you this, hell is a moral necessity, and we didn't make that call. And you don't have to defend it to people because they don't want the arguments. But what they need to understand is God has never, nor will he ever send anybody to hell. He made a provision for us to avoid hell. We reject that. God didn't send us there any more than he sent the rich young man there, or the rich man at Lazarus, that story. But when Jesus keeps talking about that, he's warning about it. Now, there's an, a theory of annihilation that's getting real popular too, and that is that the bad people, we call them sinners, <laughs> unrepentant, the bad people, like Hitler, well, they will have some punishment because after all, right, they were really bad, and they need something, okay? So something will happen, but it won't be eternal because even they don't deserve eternal. So we'll all be kind of annihilated except for us, and I guess we get to keep living with God. But the rest of them will just kind of be annihilated so there won't be. Anything. Well, that, would, that takes away a whole lot of reason to consider the gospel message. When, well, it's not going to be too bad in the long run. No. But it's also changing the gospel, and that's so dangerous. We can't make people comfortable going to hell. We need to make them so uncomfortable that they want to avoid it. And even if they only at the beginning want to avoid hell and say, what can I do to avoid hell because I really don't want to go there, the only way that they will come to Jesus in reality is through repentance, and that makes everything different. They're not avoiding hell. They're coming to grips with who they are. And the modern-day version of hell is, is changed to make it palatable. The, the gospel isn't palatable because it starts with the sinner. And it gets worse, doesn't it? Until we say, but there's an answer now that I have your attention. So Jesus goes on and he says, okay, and the angels will gather duty. And then he said, have you understood any of these things? <laughs> As a teacher, <laughs> you realize sometimes that you're right. There's several of you who teach in, that you need to look at your class and say, have you understood any of this? <laughs> the other thing that you also know as you're watching your class is they haven't understood any of this. <laughs> it's a rhetorical question. Okay, I know you didn't understand it. Let me start over and see if I can. But can I have your attention? This shows us again, Jesus recognizing who we are and our need is difficult. It's difficult for us to understand some spiritual truth. He makes it as simple as he can. But what he doesn't want to do is to quit teaching and tell those who are listening with open ears, understand the spiritual truth and they can respond to it. If it's foggy and they leave, they'll go out and say, I don't quite know what he meant. What do you think he meant? And then we'll all get together and figure out what he meant and we can all be wrong. Okay. So he said, do you have any questions? But because I know you do. I've got another thought to tell you. <laughs> okay. They said, yes. We understand. <laughs> okay. When you ask, if you ask a group of kids if they understand what you're saying, and they're tired of hearing you, sometimes they'll say, Yes. Because if we say no, she's going to keep talking. <laughs> so they say, yes. So Jesus is going to have a response to that because what does Jesus know that they don't quite understand him, right? 
Okay, so there's more than one way to continue the story. You can accept their yes and just add another story without saying, well, I know you don't understand it. You say, oh, good. I've got another story that I think you'll like. Again, these are real, real issues for us as we talk about how we talk to people because maybe you talk to them one day and you don't see them for a while and you get another chance another day and you don't want to just drone on and on, which I do, and my kids sometimes, it goes on and on, and I'm sure Jesus didn't do that, but he's also using all the skills of a master teacher as he makes sure that they understand these spiritual truths. So they said, yes, we understand. So he said, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of the house who brings out of the treasure what is new and what is old. Whose ears are going to really perk up now? The scribes and the Pharisees. If you're in the crowd and you have some of them outside and you're a scribe and you're a Pharisee, what are you going to be doing to your buddy next to you? Oh, no. What's he going to say? So now he's saying this is what a scribe should be able to do. Bring out of the old and the new. What is he saying? They should be trained in the old, right? This is the new. They're the ones that should be able to bring it all together. Because they know more of the Old Testament than the average person who is attending synagogue, certainly the average person who is in the crowd, and even more than the disciples that Jesus has been calling. So he's trying to help them understand that, that they should be bringing the old and the new together. He doesn't say any more, and now Matthew adds on to that, a caveat, which is very important and helps us to understand exactly how the scribes and the Pharisees were reacting to that. And when Jesus had finished the parables, he went away from there, and coming, excuse me, and coming to his house, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, and I love that word astonished, you know, there are not a lot of things that astonish us. We get surprised by that, but astonishment is really something that is beyond our belief. That's how they regard his teaching, because it's so different than what they've been hearing, and even the Pharisees and, and the scribes and the Sadducees, whether they liked it or not, had to realize, boy, he's topped us in every way, and that was disconcerting. I said, and where did this man get his wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Okay. He's astonishing us. How in the world? Wait a minute. Who is he? We know who he is. He can't be this astonishing teacher. Something's fishy here, isn't it? Remember, he said this repeatedly. They all questioned the carpenter's son could have this knowledge. What they understand that it is beyond what they've ever heard before. So there's something to it, but it's really hard to believe it could be Mary and Joseph's boy. Because he was just Mary and Joseph's boy. Now, he was the son of God, and that sets him completely apart from us as you know it. But rest assured that when God calls you and anoints you to be his sisters and daughters in Christ and calls you to minister to people, there will be some people say, where did they understand, where did they get that knowledge? Not because we're the Son of God, but because we've been with the Son of God. And we can teach in a way that will amaze them or make them curious and astonished at the teaching, not because we're doing it, because God is using us to do it. Not in the same way that he used Jesus, of course, because of who Jesus was. But then he said, now, we know his sisters and brothers. We go to market with them. I, this can't be him. They cannot fathom it because Jesus is both human and God. And then at the end, they, <clears throat> the prophet is without honor in his own house, right? In his own hometown. And he did not do any more mighty words there because they disbelieved. The most tragic thing that is said frequently of Jesus is that he leaves because of their disbelief. Nobody believes him anymore. But remember, I've told you that Jesus has given us permission to shake the dust of our feet and leave because they don't believe you. And if Jesus did it, 
as an example for us, we know that it's legitimate. They will not believe. He knew they were, anybody was going to believe. I can't do miracles anymore because they're missing the point. They think it's a magic show. And I didn't do here to entertain them. Okay. Okay, we need to wrap it up. And um, any, well, we got through chapter 13. Amen. <laughs> That's a big amen. I will have handouts for chapter 14 next week. Okay, we had a couple of prayer requests. Any more prayer requests? Thank you for joining us today in Marianne's study of the Gospel of Matthew. If you enjoyed today's lesson, please be sure to click that like button. And if you haven't already subscribed, why don't you hit the subscribe button and that notification bell as we post new videos each week. Thank you again for joining us. Have a blessed day and we'll see you next time.